right. Well, we made it to episode 25. I'm very excited about this. And, uh, you know, what I thought would be kind of fun for this episode, since I think of it as a milestone, because I think in fours, you know, in one it's quarter of... Milestone. Yeah, one quarter of the way there to that triple digit. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit just about how much growth we have had, because it's been a big community effort. And on episode 25, I uh, did a little bit of uh, analysis this week, and I, I checked our YouTube channel, and we now have about 625 minutes worth of video over these uh, 25 episodes. And that's before we start doing some of the extra bonus clips, which actually takes us up to about 850 minutes. So that's pretty lot. impressive. And that uh, we also have 19 people who have actually came in to sponsor the beer that everybody's drinking, which which I think is super impressive for you know basically a living room where we are you know it's not <laughs> not a real thing so so we had 19 different people that came in and uh, best we can calculate you guys have drank about 1,200 beers so congrats to that you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we uh, we're, we're approaching a thousand Twitter followers we have about 215 Facebook likes and our newsletter uh, if anybody's not signed up for that you should do that our website is now at 150 so. Um, the big, here's the real big numbers though. We have uh, 178 YouTube subscribers and 58,000 YouTube views. So that, that is really impressive, although I'll, 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 I'll be fair, 25,000 of those are all attached to the Flavor Flav video. <laughs> but, you know, we're still getting there. 60,000 is nothing to, you know, hide away from. So we're about three quarters of a way through a year since we posted our first one back on November 2nd. And yeah, I just wanted to give a big uh, round of applause to everybody that helped, all the volunteers that did this. So thank you guys. Appreciate it. All right, and speaking about volunteers, we have a little bit of a swap out. So Melissa Volkman, who was here from episode zero, even before that, um, she is moving on to do her own podcast. But I don't know how we were lucky enough to do it, but we got uh, Susan from the other uber popular Vegas podcast, Sin Shop Talk, to come in and help us out. So we're really excited. Let's give a warm welcome to, uh, to Susan for coming out and helping us. Appreciate it. And you know, the, um, the, thing, the thing about this volunteer project is when you really calculate how many hours everybody's putting in, when you think about the five or six people that help every episode just throughout filming and the time that Jackie puts in producing mm -hmm. and editing and all that stuff, we're looking at around 600 volunteer hours from everybody. So, uh, you know, it's a huge project to not be funded by the downtown project and just to be something that's uh, built by the community for the community. So, so as we go forward, if anybody has ideas about the way we could change up the segments, maybe, or if you you guys have ideas of different guests or topics that you'd um, like to see on the show we think that'd be really cool so we actually have Tobias has a uh, microphone so if anybody has any ideas I'd love to hear what you guys are thinking about the podcast um, especially if there's uh, a reason why you came I'd love to hear that like do you come here to socialize do you come here because uh, of a certain guest that kind of sparks your interest or you know tell us a little bit about what happened so I was wondering if anybody wanted to share the reason why they came out today so it's my yeah. fourth week in Vegas and uh, for me, wherever I live someplace, it's important for me to be connected to the heart of the city. You know, I want to be connected, and if that's a farmer's market or something like that. So, uh, so my second time coming. Okay. <laughs> and uh, as far as I'm concerned, like being involved in tech and things, uh, it's a great opportunity to get involved in the community and uh, just kind of like hear the heartbeat of the city and connect with the people of the city. So uh, that's why I'm here. And there's okay. fear. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Thank you. I appreciate you. All right. I, I came tonight because I've heard about the tech community in Vegas and how it's booming and how we're going to be the startup capital of the world eventually, yeah, yeah. if not today, eventually. So I wanted to see um, about everybody's startups because I think I said on Twitter earlier today that startups to me are like presents on a holiday because they may do something um, that I need done that I can't do. So uh, startups, every time one happens, it might be solving a problem in my life. So I want to see what's going on. Yeah, I'm Alan, and uh, I came here when the beer used to be always warm, and it's changed. <laughs> and now, now we have cold beer, so it's really turned upscale. But I think, you know, the reason I'm here is because uh, nothing stays the same and all changes. And uh, congratulations on the 25th um, episode, and it keeps changing. You guys document the changes that are happening, you know, that are live in, in the city. And so that's exciting. So I'll always be here, and especially now that the beer's cold. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Yeah, you know, we originally started the project as kind of a way to um, 
really document things, just take snapshots of where the community is, but it has sort of evolved into a little bit more than that. So I want it to be a place where you guys not just take a snapshot, but actually step back from all the complicated things that happen with your startups and kind of appreciate how the community steps forward for you even when you have an off week. So. Um, anyways, but yeah, go to downtownpodcast.tv forward slash contact and pull out your cell phone anytime throughout the podcast if you think up an idea. Or most importantly, have a story for us, especially because we have a certain group of people that contributes a lot. And I'd love to go get the stories that are a little bit deeper. So if it's like your friend or your brother, and if they're not always hanging out at the beat and kind of in this little circle, like let's bring them up and uh, make sure they get some attention too. So I'm pretty confident that a lot of people in this room know somebody who would like everybody would love to hear this story. So please, please get in touch with us because we want to meet those people. Yeah, absolutely. All right, um, and then I think we're gonna bring the sponsor up here and we'll get on with the regular show. But thanks again for 600 plus volunteer hours. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. All right. Yeah, so. That's you? <laughs> yeah. That's you. That's me in my younger youth days. Do that smile. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Nihongo Master, we're uh, social language learning. Uh, we're teaching uh, Japanese initially, obviously, but we're getting ready to uh, branch out to other languages. Uh, we're different from our competitors because it's social. You're scoring points, getting achievements, competing against other people, creating teams, collaborating. So learning a language on your own doesn't have to be boring, doesn't have to be tedious. Uh, you can actually have a lot of fun learning a language online with other people, and uh, we have some really great tools so our learners are actually learning the language faster. So we'd love everybody to try out the site. You know, we're out of beta. We're, we're, we're growing really, really quickly. We have over 11,000 community members, which is amazing. But we'd love to get your right. input. So uh, reach out to us on Twitter. Tell us what you think. Yeah, 11,000. That's great. Yeah. So um, like, how, do you, how are you gamifying it? Give me a quick rundown. Like, What can I expect to? So you know, one of the hardest things about learning a language is learning vocabulary. It's a very tedious thing. It's a lot of memorization. Um, we basically turn it into kind of a mini game show. And as you're uh, answering uh, your vocabulary questions correctly, you're scoring points. And, and uh, uh, that basically has you rank against other learners. And, uh, people go crazy over that, you know, and it really drives people to uh, continue their their studies. And what languages are you gonna be bringing on? You got Klingon. You know what? That I, I'd love. I'd, I'd, I'd love. You know, people are asking for like Yiddish. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's it's crazy. Uh, but uh, you know, try out the site. Tell us what you think. Tell us what language you want to see because we're ready. You know, it's a really fun platform and and uh, it's kind of grown out of the Japanese phase. A lot of people are asking us what languages. So I guess uh, we we want to get your input. Okay, and Nihongo Master, that's N-I-H-O-N-G-O. -O. Yeah, Nihongo is the Japanese word for the Japanese language, so it literally means Japanese master, so. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. You just oh, learned yeah. something. Yeah, I did. <laughs> All right, well, thank right. you for sponsoring you. the beer. Thank All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. No, it only feels forced for a little while. Then you start to appreciate it like it's real. Okay. Anyways, but we have Andrew and Veronica here. We've got a couple of the Rangers who are helping make the downtown experience a little more enjoyable, safer, and more fun for all of you guys. So I wanted to bring them on here. We see them, we see them running around. We've seen the, the jerseys for a little while now. But we'd love to hear what it's like. Like, what is it like to be a downtown Ranger? And tell us about the goal of the project altogether. Well, first of all, thank you for having us here. We love doing stuff like this. <laughs> um, well, the Downtown Ranger mission is to create the most enjoyable downtown experience worldwide. And a lot of what we do is just extending ourselves in a way that people visit downtown Fremont Street and they come away with like good hospitality and concierge service and just like an all around feeling of maybe wanting to come back in the future. And I think, I think that kind of sums up what we do in that vague sense. So, so, so what's unfair about comparing you to like a security guard? Like what's different well, about it? Well, the thing is we're not security. Oh, we okay. So any, you, any, you won't make us any? No, we're just <laughs> civilians just like you. <laughs> but uh, we do make people feel secure. So going out there every day, just knowing that we can help somebody, you never know who you're going to help is a big, you know, goal in our life when we go to do that. But Downtown Rangers is probably one of the best programs that I've ever seen in this entire city. I've lived here since I was five years old. Wow. So, okay. yeah, it's, it's every job you go to, you kind of get that, man, I got to go to work type of thing. But this job, I come in early. I get there probably a half hour, hour early. I'm excited to go. It's yeah. go help people, go talk to people, meet new people. And that option of trying to get people to come back is... 
Uh, just right, to... Tell us uh, some stories. I mean, you have a great moment that's really kind of stuck out in your head. I actually do. So the Downtown Rangers, we do uh, our own way of homeless outreach. And some of the things that we've done is just like we gather clothes and um, shoes and things like that. If we meet individuals that want the extension of those services, like we put those things with them. And we have information to refer them to organizations like the Catholic Charities, Shade Tree, and things like that. And I actually had an incident today where um, my director, David Lawson, he called me uh, over I was at the office where we keep our, our things like that. And he asked if I could grab a t-shirt and some shoes in a, a size eight. And the shoes that we do have are these huge men's shoes. Like they're not, I'm like, they, these are not a size eight, I know. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I just so happened to come to work earlier today in like a pair of flip flops that I have that are actually a size eight. And I'm oh. like, I don't, I don't need these flip flops. It's not a big deal. So I grabbed a shirt, I grabbed the flip flops and I gave them to this woman. And she had been walking around all day in her bare feet and she was just like, complaining about the heat and like it, it really wears and tears on you and I can understand like we're out there too and we understand it's really hot and I gave her those things and she gave me a hug and I don't, I had to not cry because I felt really good about it and she thanked me and like she went about her business and she said the shoes were really comfortable and it made me feel pretty good that yeah you know I helped someone in that way and it's gonna make whatever she's doing right now a lot easier that's awesome Mm -hmm. really cool. Yeah, it was a level of satisfaction. You guys are always smiling like, all <laughs> yeah. the time. Like, you know, and even if I'm walking around and I'm in a bad mood, you guys are always smiling. Always oh. sets me kind of off with the right impression when I went downtown. So it's good. That's, That's good. good to know. Thank what you. About, what about any downtown restaurants? They make you smile? Uh, some of them do. I like. I really like it when a new one opens, actually, because it's always good to sample it. Park here is actually one of my favorites that is just open. So they have things like sweet potato tater tots. Has anyone yes. had any of them? They're awesome. They're really good. Yeah, we can tell. Yeah, we can tell when it grins on your faces. <laughs> that and the the grapefruit beer that they have. That's actually. Oh, I haven't had that. Not a lot of places that have that. Really refreshing. It's good. Well, anyway, so the uh, Las Vegas Weekly did an article about the emerging downtown restaurant scene. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, they didn't, as far as, you know, they didn't mention the grapefruit beer, but they should have. It sounds like. Yeah, they should. It's... Everyone should try that. Seriously. So, yeah, so I just wanted to bring up a conversation about that. Um, like, what do you guys, do you guys have favorite restaurants? I mean, you must, or do you just try to get away after? We know, I, I prefer La Thai. I was going to say oh, La Thai 100%. You tell you grew up here, yeah, it's yeah. That's, that's the classic one. Yeah. <laughs> But you usually get awesome noodles? Or yeah, you... I just get awesome noodles. Actually, yeah. I get garlic fried rice with, with, with tofu on it. Oh, I didn't know they had I tried that garlic fried rice, uh, and it was super yeah. spicy. But I, I, I recommend I go, I go like the waterfall beef. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's switch over to 3D printing. So this is definitely Susan's realm. So just coming from the Sin bit. Shop. Yeah, so I'll let you, you just take this one and run with it. Cool, so this is actually Craig Atkins. Now, the Las Vegas Sun reported that he's now going to open like a 3D printing greenhouse. So he doesn't like the idea of incubation. So he's coming up with the, team, the term greenhouse and uh, he originally wanted to open like a shoe factory right like here and become this really big kind of shoe manufacturing and he wanted to involve 3D printing in it so like we actually had some early talks with him at Sinshop which was really cool and uh, he had these really grand plans and in the end he decided well that's probably not quite a good fit and so he decided to kind of scale it into something completely different which is helping people actually grow their 3D printing industry instead <laughs> rather than trying to grow it directly himself. And so he did his research. I remember when he came in, he knew like every tiny little detail about 3D printing. Really. And, like he was telling me things I didn't know. And like, you know, I thought I knew a couple expert, of things yeah. about it. I'm not yeah. the expert, but <laughs> I thought I knew a couple of things. And um, so basically he wants to turn it into like a, a greenhouse. I will use that term because he wants us to use it for businesses that want to basically do anything to do with 3D printing. So it could be products that they want to prototype with the technology. It could be um, any kind of services they want to offer. So if they want to offer 3D printing services. And he's really looking for people to push and innovate that actual industry, uh, which I'm really excited about. So uh, people can come in and do like a mentoring program. Um, he's pretty excited about it. Like he thinks that 3D printing will be bigger than the internet in 10 years time. So I don't know what you think about that. That's a pretty big yeah, claim. Yeah, I don't know. Bigger than the internet is always a big claim, but like the next evolution probably will be a lot of hardware. So, I mean, really start thinking about it because Apple's not just going to be the only one making iPhones and we're all buying them in the future. So right. there's a lot of opportunities here and especially it sounds like 
with uh, Craig behind you, who was who was actually on the podcast. If you guys forgot, probably around like episode fourteen or Something fifteen, like that. Mm-hmm. and he used to do uh, fulfillment for Zappos. So he's uh, totally connected into how you would distribute thousands and thousands of items. So he's definitely the right guy to talk to if you guys have a startup and you can think of a way to put a hardware tweak to mm-hmm. it. So so I think he's going to open it up in about a month's time. So it'll be, be good okay. to see that open up. And then when where is that going to be at? Uh, no details about that. Okay, yeah, it's a bit of a mystery, but okay. yeah, we'll wait and see. But they can always go to the Sin Shop, Sin Shop to get a preview. That's correct. You know, yeah, that's we do have a, a few 3D printers, there, so. so come down and have a play with them before you can actually get into the the greenhouse. I'm super excited to see yeah. just what what goes behind making something with a 3D printer. You'd be printing those uh, those sandals too. Yeah, I know. You know <laughs> it's all out and that's everybody. So our Ranger things. <laughs> So, so All right, Brian. Well, thank you for coming out. I really appreciate you guys, and uh, we're moving to our interview section now. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's a pleasure. When I first hear the name of our next guest, the thing that pops into my mind is the benefits of persistence. Because I find it hard enough at the end of the day to like just come home, let alone like come home and think about everything I said, why I said it, and what I could have done better. But that's exactly what this next guest has been doing for himself and others for the past 15 years. And you're about to see the incredible insights that that creates. So tonight's guest has a PhD in social organizational psychology. He was a former US Marine Corps sergeant, and he consulted for Zappos as a scientist who uses moral evolutionary psychology and social neuroscience to understand teams. So please put your hands together and give a warm welcome to Jesse, the Brain Whisperer Kluber. <laughs> All right. So one of the things that we know about expectations is that if you set them too high, they will be violated, and people will be done. <laughs> okay, so anyways, let's talk about the last 15 years, because you have called yourself a number of different things throughout the course of this period, and walk us through why it's changing and where it's headed. So, uh, we talked about this a little bit earlier this week, and um, you asked me sort of what, what my job was and what I studied, and my answer was, it sort of depends on how you ask the question. So, I study people, right? That's what I do. But there are a lot of different fields that study people. You could be an anthropologist, you could be a social psychologist, you could be a behavioral economist, you could be an economist. Um, and what's really interesting about all of those different fields and a couple of other sort of subfields and sub subfields is that they're all sort of starting to converge on answering the same kind of question to, just with different methods. And so if you're talking about social psychology, pop psychology, um, stuff that you hear in the media, like Malcolm Gladwell kind of stuff, um, or if you're talking about sort of evolutionary stuff, which is sort of um, what I really like to talk about, everybody's trying to answer the question, how do humans flourish? And that's the heart of the question that I answer, try to answer, um, and we're all sort of, all of the fields together started to converge on what some of those answers might be. Okay. So I don't call myself anything except maybe a behavioral scientist, social scientist, which I hate that term, but yeah. you gotta call yourself something. So. Yeah, well, and then you, when I tried to mention something about like studying happiness, you didn't like that term either. So explain, um, you don't love the, the concept of studying happiness, because why? Yeah, and that sounds really weird, especially this yeah, we're probably probably super and rough audience. Yeah, we're in the audience. So, for about 100 years, a little bit greater than 100 years, the entire field of psychology was really focused on what makes people go mad, what's wrong with people, especially after World War II, social psychology really got started, and uh, people were asking things like, well, how can really good people do evil things? You get the Holocaust, right? So all these sorts of questions, what's wrong with people? So that dominated most of psychology. Um, and really after that, especially in the late 80s, early 1990s, um, the field of positive psychology just put a spin on that and said, what do people do right? What are people doing right? Let's study happiness. Let's not study what's wrong with people. Let's study what's right with people. Um, and so I actually contend, based on some research that I've been reading over the last year, really, 
um, that maybe we took positive psychology a little bit too far. Um, so uh, I first actually told Tony about this last year. I said, last summer, I said, hey, I read this study um, where they basically found that valuing happiness makes people more dissatisfied with their lives. Yeah. And I was like, I can't, I'm not gonna you know, make any recommendations on a single study. The best thing you can say, uh, especially in most of the social sciences, and the biggest compliment you can give someone is I would love to see that study replicated. Well, since then, there have been eight separate papers that have come out suggesting something along those lines where people who value happiness, people who try to pursue happiness, are actually uh, more discontented with their lives, whether you're talking about increased risk of suicide and depression or dissatisfaction at work or with your sort of intimate relationships and things like that. And so now I'm kind of persuaded that valuing happiness is actually something that we shouldn't try to value um, sort of as an end goal, right? So research suggests that, hey, establish good social relationships that will make you happy. But if you treat social relationships as sort of a means to the end of happiness, you're not only gonna be more dissatisfied with that relationship, you're actually not gonna be as happy as you thought you were sure. going to be when you're sort of prospecting. Right, so because I mean, I, you know, I read these things and say like when you're on Facebook all the time, you're seeing everybody smiling. I mean, these are snapshots of their lives, you're not seeing them in real time, so you get this disconnected version of really how happy people are. But for someone that's a regular person and kind of like suffering through maybe all this extra happy and trying to compare themselves and feeling lower than that, what, what do you recommend? How do they get a good, rounded view of really what kind of situation they're in and how good it is? Focus on yourself. Uh, that's the first thing I would say. Um, what I mean by that is literally the more sort of self-aggrandizing you are on Facebook, the more you share, the more you update your Facebook status, the more tweets you send, the more self-interested you are and the happier you tend right. to become. But what tends to happen is when people look at other people's Facebook profiles, when, when people look at other people's Twitter feeds, people tend to share the most glowing information about themselves. They, we went on this trip and here are some pictures from my trip. And so what happens when you're sort of doing the social comparison is that you're looking at other people's awesome lives and you're saying, why am I not as happy as my friends? Right. And that tends to be the thing that really gets people discontented. Yeah. Well, so, okay, so we have a lot of startups, a lot of people that are pretty much like working around the clock for some kind of passion. Um, I wanted to switch the subject over to willpower. What do you have uh, as far as advice for people and for companies and teams as a whole to keep willpower strong, like keep that uh, goal in mind? Okay. Um, so about six million years ago, um, our ancestors became bipedal. Um, so they started walking on two legs. What tended to happen when you became when we became bipedal is that you had sort of a narrowing of the pelvic bone and of the birth canal. What coincided between about six million years ago and about two million years ago and became sort of recognizably human is that we got bigger brains. And so we had this combination between or a combination of bigger brain and smaller birth canal. What that generally meant was that we needed to start to give birth prematurely. And so humans became more, especially as infants, uh, less uh, able to take care of their daily needs. Um, and so our entire social system between about two million years ago, especially accelerating um, in sort of the late Pleistocene, about 100,000, 200,000 years ago, our entire social structure shifted from being something similar to chimps and bonobos to something that's recognizably human. What I mean by that is uh, we evolved cultures and we evolved sort of a caretaking orientation to our species. Um, so the best comparison I suppose I can give you is that um, some other sort of land mammals, herd mammals are a great example of this, um, so zebras and things like that, um, the way they distribute risk throughout their herd is strength in numbers, right? Okay. So if you're the slowest running animal, whatever predator is chasing you, don't freak out if there's a large enough number of mammals because chances are you're not going to be the one to get eaten. Right. What's interesting about humans is that we've evolved other mechanisms related to social proximity that have nothing to do with sensitivity to numbers, as in herds, uh, but have everything to do with the quality of the social relationships that we have. Right? So think about it this way. If I trust you, and I do, 
um, when I'm looking at the slope of a hill and estimating how long it would take me to get up that hill, um, how difficult it is to climb that hill, how steep is the hill, all these crazy things, right? You can think of ways that this applies to your work life too. How difficult is my job today? If, if I'm standing next to you, I'm actually going to estimate that that hill is less steep, that I can climb it about about 30% faster just because you're near me. It's got nothing to do with how okay, it's like a mental move. social support or something it's, like that? Yeah, it's, uh, so, so the trick is this. Um, other species have figured out ways to essentially play on strength and numbers. We've evolved ways culturally um, to adapt our environment such that quality of our relationships predicts how well and how difficult, how well we can navigate our environments and how difficult we perceive those environments to be. So are you saying like a tech team that has like a few quality friends that like really understand each other is going to out be like a kind of a numbers group, right? Like a big Microsoft, they can really do some damage comparatively? Exactly. That's exactly yeah. what I'm saying. So it's not happiness, it's quality of relationship? Yeah, so I would say that it's, it's something that. related to trust, quality relationships, and social support. So I feel like this person would have my back if something went disastrously wrong. Now think about how different this is from saying um, something like, throughout most of the animal kingdom, the only time calories are expended um, is when you actually help me, right? But you don't actually have to help me do anything with respect to my work, the things that I'm doing, debugging code or whatever it is, all I have to know is that, just that I would. Dylan's got my back just in case something goes wrong. You expend no calories. And evolutionarily, this makes perfect sense as an adaptation because yeah. guess what? Everybody's preserving a bunch of calories because they have sort of circles of trust and they have high quality social. So maybe it should be advantageous for a small startup to just basically have a pizza night and make sure they bring up a few topics about how I can handle a couple of the problems in your life if it comes down to it. And that would just be good enough, not even that it would yeah. come down to it, right? Well, I think rapport is good. I think trust is better. I think psychological safety, the sense that no no matter what I do, in a meeting, or especially in a meeting with someone of higher social status, say the boss, the CEO, the founder, whoever, um, if I know that Dylan would do nothing to undermine my efforts, that's really the thing that starts to make people feel like they're supported by their peers. Um, the other thing that I suppose I would recommend for anyone in any organization, actually, let me let me pull the audience on this one. Yeah. Um, so studies and organizational behavior, they say all kinds of stuff leads to things like creativity and to job satisfaction, happiness, all that stuff, right? So what, what do those things look like and what are they? Um, so I'll give you a list of, off the top of my head, maybe three things. So social support is, is one of those things, keep that in your head. So the amount of support that you're deriving from your peers. Um, and now we're kind of leaving the audience based on <laughs> what we just said, but keep that in your mind. Um, progress on, on sort of meaningful tasks, so every day you make a little progress on something you're working on. And uh, let's say incentives, so properly aligned incentives. So if I work harder, I'll get more money. So just to preface this a little bit, all three of those things have been shown to lead to job satisfaction, creativity, things like that. So raise your hand if you think that um, making, pro these are in particular order, making progress on meaningful goals is the, things, is the thing that is the primary driver of job satisfaction, creativity. So, one or two people. Is there a progress you should? All right. Um, how about social support? So, the people around me that like, they like me and I trust them. Okay, so we've got maybe an icy half. Uh, what about, what was the last one I said? Uh, incentives, properly aligned incentives. So, the incentive structure, at the end of the day, people are being rational or at least somewhat rational about the things Money, that they stand, yeah. right, the things yeah. you stand to benefit based on your own work. So, raise your hands for that one. Do you want me to get some Sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, I'm sorry, how do our audience get? Are we all right? Um, everybody did horribly. Oh. 
Um, and let's make a little bit of a broader point here. So there are so many studies, you go on Forbes, you go on Inc, you go on all these websites, and there are all these studies that are showing people, and you know, founders and entrepreneurs are interested to find out, oh my God, who do I hire? Like, what's gonna be the best hire? What's gonna make my employees happy? What's gonna make them creative? What are all these things? And we get these big lists in our heads, um, like what I just gave you. But there's a distinction to be made between things that A leads to B, B in this case meaning satisfaction, creativity, lower turnover rates, job satisfaction, whatever, right? Um, and A is all those things, meditation makes your employers happier, happy worker, you know, uh, is a productive worker and so forth. The correct answer actually is making progress on meaningful work. Every that wasn't in the pre-interview, everyone. <laughs> that was not in the pre-interview. Yeah. So, so this is really the value, I think, of social science, is not coming up with some ingenious study finding that A leads to B, and then nobody knows what the effect size is. Sometimes there's a small intervention that can make a huge difference, and sometimes there's a small intervention that makes something of a difference, uh, but it's just one of those sort of tools that you can use. It's just throw everything at it. So, so you're talking about chopping like a big project up into just little teeny goals that make you feel happy every night or it's every hour? Or effective. Effective. Well, probably not every hour. But, but yeah, but every evening. So essentially, yeah, so essentially what I'm telling you is that if you had to do one thing, given your workforce, you know, aside from, you know, firing everybody and hiring a, a bunch of new people, if you had to do one thing, I would actually say that make people's work meaningful and have a little bit, sort of a small win every single day. Okay. But uh, I am really happy that you were here sharing this information and everybody check them out if you got a startup. So. Thanks for the free beer. Thank you. Yeah. Be just the best, be just <laughs> So we have some very good events coming up very soon. On the June 19th, we have an education deli at 5 30 p.m. Now the education deli is aiming to bring together families who want to be more involved in schools here, which I think is a really great cause. So they want to get everybody together to brainstorm on ideas on how they can make more positive schools and make schools a more positive experience in general. So it's actually a really cool venue called uh, the Learning Village, which I've actually never heard of, so I kind of want to check that out now. It's uh, on 727 Fremont Street East in Las Vegas. And again, that's June 19th at 530. And uh, bring your family, all kids and, and uh, teachers and all sorts of, sort of uh, people that are interested in education. That's right up your alley. I'll be there. Oh, good. And on June 19th, we have another event in the education sort of thing. If you're more into robots, uh, I'm a little biased. Right? <laughs> yeah. behind me is a very cool scanning sort of eye beam and uh, the pumpkin is unfortunately not included but you can actually pull this over a pumpkin. <laughs> so if you attend this workshop you will be putting together the scanning of eye and uh, we have a really cool guy called Justin Hayden who will be actually taking the class and uh, you get to take the kit home with you. It's a $30 kit and you get to assemble it. You get to actually have a working version. We do include batteries as well which is really exciting. Yeah. No Christmas Day to us there. And uh, you'll actually be able to take everything home and show everything off once you complete with it. So if you haven't been to Sinshaw, this is actually a really good excuse to come down and check us out. You can have a look at our equipment, but also have a look about making a robot. I don't know about you, but if you're not a side one, are you actually going to come down and do this? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I can't not have one of those sitting on this table next week. <laughs> I wish there was an animation because that eye just really yeah. scans alongside like this, and it looks very much like a side one. Yeah, it was a gift, too. I loved it at first. It was like blinking all that. <laughs> Uh, the last event that we have is actually by our lovely Adam Cremon, who has a new startup called Coupler, and that's on coupler.com if you want more information. Now, Coupler aims to bring couples together um, working on fun events so you can meet other couples in Las Vegas and have a lot of fun doing so. This particular event is the Cook Breakfast at the Ronald McDonald House, and it's on June 23rd. And essentially, uh, when you register for the event, the organizers will be emailing all of the couples, asking them what they want to cook. And once they've taken those suggestions, they'll buy the food, you rock up on the day, and you all cook together for the Ronald McDonald House cause. Now, all the proceeds from the event will also be donated to the Ronald McDonald House in Greater Las Vegas. So I think that's actually a really cool idea. You get to come and cook breakfast for people on Saturday, which is really cool. 
again, that's June 23rd, and you can register for your tickets on TicketCake, and if you want more information on that, you should check out Coupler.com. And that's all for this week. Yeah, you can screw up. Good job. <laughs> All right, well, I want to move the conversation over to Connie. So I'm really glad we finally got you on the podcast, but uh, tell us a little bit about the Ninth Bridge Parent Information Session. Okay, cool. So the Parent Information Sessions are every Thursday at 6 p.m., and it's for Ninth Bridge School, which is going to be an early childhood center that we're opening this August for students 6 years old through kindergarten. No, August, huh? Yes, I didn't realize. August 26 is the first day of school. <laughs> are you nervous for it? Um, no, I'm excited. Okay. I'm excited. <laughs> Some days nervous, yes. <laughs> Well, so tell us what the parents can expect. Um, so we'll essentially give an overview of Knife Bridge. Uh, we are focusing on entrepreneurship and creativity using your approaches in neuroscience and social emotional learning. Um, so we've actually put together a group of local and um, global think tank members that are experts in early childhood, um, curriculum development, neuroscience, and positive psychology. So they'll learn a little bit about you know our curriculum and also um, our amazing program. Okay, so, so when some parents bring their kids by, that's what, what you tell them is that like, if, if you raise your kids in this environment, they have a higher likelihood of being successful or entrepreneurial, or what's the... I think so, point? yeah, so uh, there's a lot Are of... Are you taking a gamble on them, or what? <laughs> it's going to yeah. be a lot of hands-on learning. We're um, bringing in a lot of neuroscience, and so really teaching to how the brain actually learns. So we have this great reading program that's based in neuroplasticity, um, and then also um, incorporating optimism and resilience, and just, you know, Good. Yeah, I mean, I think education could use an overhaul, so. Um, okay, so that is, give me the information on where they can check out more information on the website or? Yeah, so um, you can check out more information on Nine Bridge School or sign up for a parent info session um, at www.ninebridgeschool.com. Right, that's with the number 9th yes. and then P-R-I-D-G. Like we're super excited. Um, you know, everyone has been so supportive. And, you know, as the kids grow older and everything, like what's really, really awesome about this project is just kind of being here within the community. And we want to see the school as, you know, um, the city is our classroom. And so yeah. there's so many amazing people and resources. And we really want to take school outside the walls as well. Okay. So, so. Good. Well, God knows that would have been better if I, <laughs> I went to that school. So I right, thank you for coming out, Connie. And thank all of you guys for coming out for episode 25. We're Getting further and further. Order the way there.